this is uh, a review of the semester. Um, and I'm doing that by um, proposing here 10 principles of humanitarian engineering. There's a lot of ways to organize the main ideas of this course. I tried to eliminate all things that were sort of secondary, I felt. That's hard to do because there's a lot of uh, various points, but I think these are representative of the, the key ideas. Um, they are not ordered entirely in terms of importance one through 10. Um, I don't think that's really possible, but I think number one is the most important, okay, of any of the others. Um, the other ones you could debate what's, what's most important um, from those. Um, but I want to start, before I get into the 10 principles, and talk a little bit about um, sort of uh, the humanitarian engineering and a, sort of a theory of humanitarian ed engineering education. Uh, it, it, you may know that there's not, uh, there's not like a huge number of humanitarian engineering courses taught around the world. Um, it's not like circuit theory or calculus or something like that. Um, so. Uh, Development of a sort of a way to do this is, is one of the main challenges. Um, I think if you were asking me one of the biggest challenges um, in putting this course together and the corresponding book, it's, it's the integration of the social sciences um, in a firm way. I mean, we all took social sciences as, as sort of our general education requirements, okay? We have our engineering, but how do you sort of put those together? That's, it's, that's one of the challenges. Um, so here's the way um, I look at it. Um, as you know now, I like to use pictures. So this is mostly pictures. So I look at it this way. Um, I joke that I, uh, to a number of people that I've been uh, dis dissecting undergraduate brains for the last 12 years in this area. I take them up into the 12th floor, or 10th floor of, uh, no, there's no 10th floor, 8th floor of Greece in our controls lab and do that. Basically, the people that do humanitarian engineering in Ohio State will fit what I'm talking about, okay? That's what I find over time. I think they're split brain, okay? Now, I don't subscribe to all the split brain theories because they've been shown, it's, it's a gross simplification, but it's just to make a point. So on the left side of the brain is sort of all this stuff. And for instance, in engineering, you mechanical engineers, you're still called gearheads, like the guy in the lower left, okay? So, um, you know, civil engineers, when I was undergrad, we called you people dirt pounders. And we have all kinds of derogatory names, you know. Um, but the point is, is that a lot of engineering is sort of over here, and the technical parts of this class are sort of over here, right? You see what I picked. There's the PID controller up there, financial management for the poor person. This is the integration of the spread of technology. This figure says a lot about this course. Why? Because it was about the fusion of technology that would improve an economic situation for people. And this, in one diagram, did that because it's related to fusion, how much technology fusion there is in a country, and capital. I mean, this, this says a lot, actually. That one, that's called a face plan. And then this was the community dynamic simulation for 100 people, right? And their wealth, health, education, Right? And resource use, sustainability. This diagram says a lot about what we learned in this class. But if you show that to your friend at a party or something, they're going to go, what? Okay. Um, this equation here is the one that was used to generate this. This is the mathematics that did this up here. Okay. So for me, well, yeah, all this stuff is floating around in my head. Okay. You just don't admit it to people, you know, like my wife, I don't tell my wife that. She knows it's there, you don't like, emphasize that, okay? <coughs> On the other hand, here's pictures of OSU students over the years doing humanitarian engineering in a field. A picture from Ghana up top. Uh, this is in Choloteca, Siete de Mayo in uh, Honduras, near Choloteca, um, building cook stove. Um, this is STEM education with Mayan children, in, like Mary Sher and uh, Panajachel, uh, Guatemala. This is another Guatemala project that happened about uh, eight years ago. Okay, so there's sort of this side. So what I see in the students I work with, and the faculty, and the staff, there's sort of this compassion. I guess is one way to summarize it. There's many ways to summarize it: wanting to help, caring about people, 
wanting to help improve society. There's sort of all this stuff that's sort of on this side of the brain over here in a sense, okay? And then we often think that the, the cold analytical mathematics differential equations is on the left side. It's got nothing to do with the right side, right? And I think I, I'm fundamentally opposed to that idea. That, that is a gross distortion in my mind for the, the, of how, because the people that I talk with all the time are, have all of that in their head. It's, it's both sides. And there's nothing wrong with that, okay? Um, I think you should be proud of it, in fact. I mean, it's a different way to think, but it's going to solve some root cause problems, right? Clean water, for instance. You're not going to get clean water by hugging people. You're going to get clean water by doing good science and technology, right? So, so I think that um, this integration has a lot of value. Um, so the little, in a certain sense, see these little bridges right here? Um, this class is just about that, creating the bridges creating the connections between the two to show how relevant this is to this, okay? But see, it's not just unidirectional. It's not just all about how we bring science and technology over here. You know, people bring needs and wants, desires, concerns, etc. Over <coughs> towards here, we create things there to work. So it's, it's bidirectional, it's sort of intimately coupled. In a certain sense, then, the split brain idea that's popular, left brain, right brain, analytical versus creative, all that stuff, is ridiculous. It's all together. Because we all know that in engineering, even though many people don't understand it, such as a number of prominent economists, there's great creativity that's required on this side in the analytical part, in the math, in the science, in the technology. It's great creativity that's required. Okay? And, and uh, that's a right brain function, traditionally. That's what's thought of as, but that's belonging in a sense. This is all integrated, but so this is what I see um, play out with the people I work with. They're sort of, they're sort of, you know, it may be, what's interesting is every person's different I work with. So this is a gross simplification. But what happens is, is sometimes their heart is way over here and they're doing they just haven't had a lot of skills over here, and they like this over here a lot. Like the math, like the simulations, like the technology, the appropriate technology, whatever, okay? Um, some are kind of camped more here, but they really want to make it work over here because they care about people. So there's different tendencies both ways, okay? But it, I think that uh, for me, this is what I've learned on about people I've worked with, and again, I would be the first to admit this is uh, you know this isn't like some kind of a psychoanalysis, um, longitudinal psychoanalysis. I'm not claiming anything like that, it, but I think it does for me help me understand how to go about meeting you, you know, and saying um, meeting the. I think I think you got to understand what students want in the end. Students get in the end, in terms of education, in terms of a mentoring engineering program. We'd have no program at Ohio State if it weren't for the student desire to do this stuff, period. This class wouldn't exist, no trips to anywhere, Honduras, anywhere, unless the students didn't want to do it. So in the end, students have a great sort of power. And that power is coming about from what I've seen. What's, what's odd about, the, the, that's different here, isn't the left side. Engineers have been doing that for eons. It's that now people are coming and they want to do the right side. But they also want to do the left side. They want to do both. Okay? So, um, anyway, that's my, I'd rather think of it as a proposal. I know that, you know, you might have a different view. I mean, I'd love to have inputs on this. If you don't want to do it now, uh, you know, I'll chat with you later. But anybody have any comments? What does, it, does it ring? Does it have any, does it seem? I'm seeing some yeses, and other people are kind of like, I don't know. Because I care, I care about this because primarily my job is to be an educator, okay? I mean, in the end, that's what I'm you know, really trying to do. And so I need to understand these things uh, myself because it helps me improve um, you know, a book or class. And I'll, my hope is that every time it gets better, this is a big challenge. The other big challenge for me uh, that is really quite a concern is, is that this is a highly uh, US-centric class and book. 
I mean, I'm just a lone white guy. Okay, well, I'm trying to get lots of inputs from a lot of people. You're seeing my acknowledgement list grow and grow, but it's difficult. It is really difficult. So I'm sure it's a, it's a biased view. I'm sure. But my hope is that uh, uh, it becomes less biased as time goes on by gathering uh, more input. Okay, next. Um, ten principles. Number one is the most important one. And it's this. Just focus on people. It's an extremely simple idea in, at, on the surface. It is not in practice. Okay, and so what does it mean in the end? Well, the, well, let's ignore the words for a minute. Just talk about these people. So, um, you know, so everybody's unique. And you, you essentially, have, I think what you have to learn to do, I talked about my, with this, this, this slide with my wife on a walk this morning, how to get this slide right. Um, you, I think what you have to do is look past the surface. I mean, forget about the surface. It just doesn't matter. Forget about the symptom. Forget about, you know, whatever. Just forget about that. And think you're just talking to a human being, you know, heart and mind. And that's it. That is hard to do. Okay, I don't know about you. Maybe it's easy for you. If you can do this, you have a real gift. I've met, there's not that many people I've ever met that can do this. You know, let me tell you what I think it's easy for me. I can talk to this kid. You know what I'm saying? I have to switch to Spanish. Okay, my Spanish is good enough to talk to her. <coughs> okay, but I don't have any problem with it. I can look past, you know, her dirty, you know, feet. Um, dress, I can look past it all and talk to her as a human, okay? Now the thing is, is it can be harder over here. First, it's a little harder for me in a sense. Um, I'm not sure exactly what it is. Maybe it's fear. It's, I think it's lack of understanding though, is honestly. Why I have a hard time talking to this guy is simply a lack of understanding, okay? If I approach him, ignore all, all the, you know, whatever is bothersome about the image, you know, like, why are you flying that sign, man? I mean, you shouldn't be hungry, you should be working, unemployment's low, all that. Just forget all that stuff. That's ridiculous. And just be able to talk to him. I mean, what you discover pretty darn fast is a lot of people are just normal people. You know, who was with me when we talked to Bob? Anybody? Aaron was. Courtney was. You see what I'm saying? Bob was a pretty normal guy, right? I mean, we were not building shelter. Bob's been homeless, what, eight years, I think it was? Okay? Wow. That's like, he was smart, wasn't he? Very smart. Very smart guy. Amazing. Yeah. I mean, and, I mean, could you be friends with Bob? Yeah. Um, you could text him. Yeah, you can text him. He's got text. I mean, so, so look, I mean, you can do this, and it works, and it is... It's just as fun as getting to know Tyler. Just kidding, Tyler. But no, it is. I mean, I'm, I meant that. There's no disrespect to Tyler. I mean, these are people. Now, the woman here, I put the woman up. Uh, so these, the strategic choice of pictures. A child, a man, and a woman. Okay? Now, the thing is, with a woman, um, you may be more or less comfortable talking to a woman than a man. Fine. Okay, fine. That's understandable. You know, you may find one or the other more threatening, okay? Um, you may not be as comfortable, you know, with the opposite gender. Who knows what it is? Whatever it is. But again, though, they deserve to be talked to as a human. Again, you've heard me say several times in this class, when, when I go on these trips, in the end, I still think the most valuable thing is, guess what? Engaging with people, solidarity, talking to people. They appreciate it because they're not treated with respect. They're, they're sometimes uh, bored, sometimes lonely as all get out because people won't talk to them because they're afraid of them. Just engage and talk. Now, the thing is, the reason I say this is so important is because I think everything else we talk in class flows from this. If you can truly do this, you gain a realistic, more realistic view of the person, right? You, you understand maybe what they need and want just by talking to them. It's not some complex participatory action research. It's just talk to people, okay? And then from that flows 
technologies and everything else. It all comes from that sort of ability. I think it's good for, for me, I like to talk about this issue because this is over time been difficult for me and I've evolved, honestly, on this point. Um, I, I don't know exactly where I'm at. I can't say to you, oh, could I meet this person, not be able to talk to him, feel very uncomfortable talking to this person. I, I don't, I haven't had, I don't have that problem these days. I mean, last year I had a conversation for about a half hour with the homeless person in Columbus who's schizophrenic, severe. Uh, this is a little tough. It's very unusual, but <laughs> I mean, you, you, with, he sort of connected with us. I don't know what it meant to him. I have no idea. Okay, I have no idea. But I think it's important to do. Now, my wife pointed out to me in the talk this morning, when she pointed out it very interesting. She says, yeah, well, that's true, Kevin. But you know the person sitting next to you? <laughs> they can be much more soft than any of these people. And you never know. Right? I mean, that's something that's amazing. And you know, the older I get, the more I see of that. You find out there's this issue. There's this, you know, whatever it was. You don't know what happened to this person. You don't know what the, is happening to them today. You don't know. Okay? People are too complex. Okay? People can hide things. Sometimes that's okay, you know, but you don't know. But the, the class is, what's complex about this class is, is that, you know, somehow we want to focus on suffering, right? I mean, I don't know what we should focus on the most. Everybody in their discipline tends to pick something. You civil engineers pick water and sanitation, whatever. And everybody sort of picks a different thing. But if you think about it for a moment, really, what is it you're trying to do? I think we're trying to end suffering. I think, I think that's what it is. The problem is, <laughs> suffering is a complex thing. Who defines suffering? I mean, do you know if I'm suffering? You don't know. You do not know if I'm suffering. You don't know. I don't know about you either. And, and yet, we look at situations like this and we say, there's some suffering going on there somehow. We ought to do something about it. Okay, so it's tricky. I think it's virtually impossible to know if somebody's suffering, unless in the obvious cases. And there are, are obvious cases, okay? But I think you have to ask people and talk to people. You know, in the end, you have to. Okay? Comments. How easy do you find it to talk to people? Just me? Yes, cool. I think that you're pretty much right on the money um, with like your assessment. I think that looking at like those three pictures, I could easily go up to the child. I mean, also switching in Spanish, but like the woman I could see myself going up to, but the man would be a lot harder for me, at least on my own. Yeah. Um, but I also am like, trying to change that throughout as I like grow. Yeah, that's a hard one, isn't it? And I, I, I chose also here the U.S. and international uh, for explicitly because, see, I know there's people that are not happy with this situation and are not sympathetic towards this situation. I understand that very, very clearly, okay? But you go to these countries and you talk to people, typically the wealthier people, and guess what? They have the same attitude towards these people. Seems pretty crass, doesn't it? It's easy to look at them and say, oh, you're crass. I mean, you, you don't care about those little poor kids? And yeah, we do it here in our country. I mean, it's, it's like, it's very hypocritical, I think. Anybody else? This applies also to disabled persons like paraplegics. Um, I think it's a, that's, a, mm, that's an important case, actually. Uh, remember, Marsha Sen said his estimates are there's 600 million disabled persons in the world. <gasps> that means physically disabled or mentally disabled. That's a lot of people. His claim in his book is those are the worst cases. Those are the ones that really need attention. Okay, so here's the problem. It, it, what did we say? What was the percentage of homeless people in the United States? 643,000 right now. Um, that are, have severe mental illness. Anybody remember? I know it's way back. 39%. 
39%. So they don't deserve any compassion, right? I mean, see the, see the problem? I mean, I think this is a really a difficult issue um, to deal with. And ask, you know, how, how the problem, you know, how these issues should be fixed, you know? How, how these people deserve help. I'm adamant about that. The question is how to do it. And there's a lot of people who care about this issue. A lot of people in Columbus. Columbus, in fact, is a model city for handle, helping the homeless in the United States. We have some of the lowest rates in the United States. I mean, Columbus should be proud, but there's still an estimated 1,500 or more. The most conservative estimates say around 1,500 in central Ohio. Okay, um, It's probably a lot more than that um, because they, they can't count these things accurately. Anybody else want to comment? Okay, next slide. Um, so I think this is, in my mind, uh, the second most important thing, especially the first few. So building relationships is very important. It's related to the last slide. Can you simply talk to people at their level? Maybe not in their language, but get a translator. In other words, just relate to people, okay? Uh, by doing that, you begin to form relationships which are crucial in getting anything done. Remember what Holman said, everything happens on the back of a relationship. Woo, that's true. You don't have good relationships with the community, nothing's going to get done. Okay? That includes with the partner. But you're building is trust, and you're overcoming things, like past things, for instance, our government has done to overthrow their government, or, thank you, or, Thanks, Ben. Um, what's up? One more rat at the door. Um, you know, when, when our government has overthrown their government or stolen part of their country or uh, what? who knows what. So you shouldn't assume there's gonna be, you're going to be trusted just because you're a trustworthy person in the United States. Uh, trying to promote community participation. Uh, using multidisciplinary teams such as social workers uh, and trying to get cooperation amongst a group of people. These are difficult things to do. They take good communication skills. They take listen, listen, listen. You have to listen. Okay? This takes time too. And what comes out of this is you, you come to understand needs, assets, and desires, and it all happens via listening. Okay? Um, this piece is um, soft from an engineering perspective. That's the term that engineers use for the soft, fluffy things, you know? They usually don't matter in engineering, right? But guess what, they do here, a lot. You're not gonna get anything done unless you can get this second item right. It's not gonna happen. You're not gonna get anything useful done, let's put it that way. If you don't know what people need, you're gonna get, get that wrong, <laughs> and then you've done nothing, you're just creating technology trash that's gonna lay around the world. So this is a hard, hard thing to deal with, but we have to get better at learning how to do it if, if you're going to do um, good humanitarian engineering. Okay, next. Understand the social and physical context, people, communities, culture, and history. So uh, I, I think this is just, for me, this is my view of the world. I found it on you know, Google Images where I find every good picture. Uh, you know, that's the world up close, I would call it. The world from a distance is blue, green, and white with snow, right? But this is, this is sort of, when you travel around, it's, a, it's fascinating, the, the diversity, culture. It's absolutely beautiful. And you have to understand that this, this sort of drive the context of each situation. It's very hard to understand, okay? But you can do it. Be a study and you know, going there and just being open-minded and learning, sort of taking a playful attitude. And you don't have to, in respecting diversity, but I would call it celebrating diversity. In other words, it's fun, okay? It's just fun. Okay, so the people in the communities are meshed in this, in this culture and history. And then the stuff around them matters. The built, the so-called built environment is like everything people build. And the natural environment is, you know, lakes, rivers, deserts, whatever the resources, the institutions like governments or NGOs, or whatever. And so you need to understand this, this whole context. And you say, why do we need to know that? Well, okay, on the previous slide, you need to understand people because you need to know what they need. And that sets cons constraints on technology design. Guess what? So does this. All these issues 
set constraints on your technology design. So as an engineer, I'm thinking of everything in terms of engineering in the sense on these slides, on these, these last two, not the first slide, but the, some of this last stuff. Because I've got to get all of those constraints into math or in technology constraints. I've got to be able to say, the performance of the water filtration system must be this. I've got to be able to say, you know, this kind of pump just isn't going to work in this context because of this people thing or because of this, okay? So you've got to sort of translate all this into constraints. This takes some, what I would call, expansive thinking. It is not trivial. Number four, be a professional humanitarian engineer. So professionalism uh, is, is basically defined to be competence and conduct, okay? Competence means what you would expect for engineering. Top, technical competence, science, math, technology. You get it? And basically, if you're really competent, you do not satisfy the minimum for competence to do a project. You've got a bunch of other stuff you know in the background. You know, like that matters a lot. Somebody that's really competent, it's, it's, they seem like when you talk to them, they seem you probe, 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 and they, they've got depth in every direction. It's absolutely fascinating. Okay, so that's the way you, sh you should be to be able to do this job right. <laughs> and what you do, when you think about building competence, you don't think about the next homework assignment or the final exam. You go back to right there. Because this is your objective, whatever one it is. Okay, so that's your objective to get it right for people. That's why you want to be competent. Okay, so you create the best design that meets all these constraints. Huh, you know, performance, level, cost, environmental, social, etc. Because, I mean, there was tons of them, right? We had tons of constraints in context, keeping the people firmly in mind. And we do that in the context of a team. I mean, this is a very complex design process um, that requires a lot of competence and bringing a lot of things to play at the same time, okay? And there's, so next. Um, build technological capacity. There's a number of reasons to do this. Remember, technological capacity is sort of everything to do with technology and its use, how to create it, how to modify it, how to operate it, how to maintain it, all kinds of stuff. And we talked about the you know, fundamental dictate from social justice for the engineer is reduce the inequality of technological capacity. Because people you're working with don't have technological capacity, it greatly affects econo the economics of their situation, their health, their education, etc. Okay? So, we want to empower the community to create its own solutions. We are in a unique position as engineers. We have a lot of knowledge that when you get it, 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 it away, people, it's not easy knowledge. Science isn't easy, math isn't easy, technology is not easy. And therefore, if you can give it to people and they can use it, which they want to, for a lot of reasons like their health, for instance, water filtration, well, they're empowered. Right? They're just fundamentally unpowered. And if you do that with respect to also paying attention to diversity, not just giving it to the boys and men, but to the girls and women, that's it. very empowering because they're doing something then that the boys and men have traditionally done, for instance. So empowerment means different things to different people. We talked about doing this in the community, um, and we talked about it for STEM education to empower students of all sorts. i um, thinking of students learning basic STEM or to target improved situations in the community. Um, and so the idea of building technological capacity is not just education. It's education plus like the lab demo in the field. You know, you're doing the water filtration, you're showing somebody how to operate it, or how to maintain it, how to repair the pump, whatever it is. Okay, so a, a lot of it's education, but at least some of it's really hands-on education. Okay. Okay, so and we're engineers are uniquely qualified to do this, of course, right? Next, in turn, ensure long-term positive impact. So we design for reliability in extreme conditions. This is a hard, hard problem. Engineers always know this is a hard problem. How do the how do the Apple engineers design this? to be this phone to be reliable, as reliable as it is. It's amazingly reliable, I think. And that is a difficult problem. In, in larger companies, they have a whole department called reliability engineering, or 
quality assurance or whatever, okay? There's reason for that. So we have to do that too on location. And then I, I bring up the issue of the, this is so important, of building um, technological capacity for operation and maintenance of technology so that when you get on the pl plane on the way home, the technology <coughs> isn't going to fail before you land in the United States. Okay? That stuff is happening. Next. Seven, understand impact on or from the social context. So people, power relations. Education, health, economic development. So what's the impact on people? Well, there can be economic impact due to the technology. There can be health impact. There can be education impact, STEM education. On and on. The other thing that happens is really fascinating is technology affects power. In a community even. It certainly does at the global level. I mean, why have some of these uh, demonstrations been going on over the last five years? Because of Facebook. <laughs> Twitter, people are rising up because they have information and they're, they're forming groups and they're throwing governments out, okay? But what happened in the water of Iola? Who, what, the pump technology did what with respect to power relations? Does anybody remember? Yes? It caused the women to gain power. It empowered the women. Who would have figured? But think about it. Early in the class, we said, is there a technology that will reduce discrimination in the world? However you want to define it, whether it's with respect to the color of your skin, your gender, your sexuality, whatever it is, okay? What in the world can we do? There's an answer, isn't there? Pump technology actually empowers women. Why? Amazing, isn't it? You wouldn't think, necessarily. There's another example I've come across with uh, down in Guatemala, um, my family's the NGO we work with. They give us a tour, go in a room, and a bunch of sewing machines, and a bunch of Mayan women learning how to sew. Okay, they say, this is our women's empowerment program. And so, in the United States, the women here would say, yeah, right. Learning how to sew is women's empowerment. Don't laugh, Valerie. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> but in Guatemala, sewing by hand or with the loom, okay, is a woman's job, a man's job is using the machine to sew. Okay, so technology is the sewing machine, right? And it is empowering women. So again, I think the fundamental principle, that, there's a principle, think of those two cases. The principle is simply reduce the toil for women. Well, duh, of course that's the issue. What do you think the dishwasher had an influence on or the refrigerator? I mean, think about the influence that has had on empowerment of women in this country. Same ideas happen everywhere. Reduce the toil. I mean, remember the water by leg. I mean, the women and the children are hauling water. Oh, I mean, this is happening all over the world still. Solve these problems and you're going to empower women. If, you, if that's what you're concerned with. I believe in having your own passion. If you want to help women, go do it. If you want to help men, go do it. Just do something. Okay, or children. Go, go, work, go work with an orphanage, you know. Okay, sustainability. Um, well, we talked about this extensively. Resource use and pollution impacts. This terrible map of the world with surface temp rising surface temperatures from NASA or this from this uh, paper about planetary boundaries and how we're violating <coughs> planetary boundaries and biodiversity loss and we're in a dangerous situation with climate change and the nitrogen cycle. We're in a bad, really bad situation. Um, so... Wherever we go, whatever we do, we gotta keep this in mind because remember, we don't wanna be trying to end poverty in the world and get development. In the meantime, the whole world falls apart because of terrible climate change or something. We have to pay attention to both issues. It's got, it has to be a, considered a constraint. It's gonna be emphasized more and more in your lifetimes because it's gonna get worse and worse, almost assuredly. Uh, in particular, 2015, remember the Millennium Development Goals are done this year and they're starting the next set of goals. People are saying the next set of goals will be the sustainable development goals. So creating a real emphasis on sustainability, okay? Um, so we have to be a part of that. Engineers have a lot to say about it, a lot of expertise, creating real practical solutions on the ground, okay? Such as with life cycle design, or so-called sustainable design. Next, number nine, assess outcomes. Uh, 
So you want to know how you deploy some technology, you want to know how effective it is on real people in health, education, economics, etc. Um, what are the side effects? We talked about some of this in class. And uses the basis, um, if we can use those assessments, we find out things are really good, then we scale up. Scale up means you come up with a great water solution for Ethiopia, this is awesome, you spread around Ethiopia. And it's working so good everywhere in Ethiopia that you go to Kenya or what you go to another country. That's scale up. Remember Jeffrey Sachs says, we need that. We need a lot of that. He felt there's a lot of good solutions out there that aren't getting spread and not getting scaled up. Okay. Next. Number 10. So promote um, uh, human dignity, rights, and fulfillment. Now, I understand this is related to the first slide. Very close related. Because the fundamental issue of dignity is what I was talking about on the first slide, right? With the little girl, the homeless people, okay? But there's also, it's not just, it's dignity, but it's rights too, and it's fulfillment, you know? How do we sort of raise up as people? Um, and uh, so the focus in this course is not actually on economic development per se. The focus in this course is on human development. Economic development is part of that. Human development includes getting an education. It includes health, okay, and other things. So um, connected to all this is ideas from social justice. Some people would criticize and say, you spent way too much time on social justice. Well, okay, you might be able to say that, but remember, social justice is the goal. Well, if you don't have the goal in mind, you've got a problem, okay, because you don't know where you're going. Number one. Number two, as I, the more and more I read, when I read top economists like, Jeff, like Jeffrey Sachs in his new book, or um, <coughs> Bill Easterly in his new book, The Tyranny of the Experts, they're all talking about social justice and rights and how crucial it is. I mean, Sachs emphasizes social inclusion hugely. Okay, go see his Coursera course. Okay, so I think it is really a crucial issue. Um, next, reduction of inequalities in technological capacity. And then the promotion of inclusiveness. See, engineers have failed on this last point. We know that, okay, in a certain sense. Uh, traditionally in this country, engineering has been a male profession. We all know that, okay? It's changing, thankfully. And I hope it changes more. Um, maybe it will, I don't know. This might be the field that will change it. Um, I, in a couple months ago, I had a group meeting with some faculty and Professor Betty Lisa Anderson. We were talking about, you know, humanitarian engineering initiatives, what we should be doing at Ohio State. She said, tell you what, make an undergraduate degree in humanitarian engineering, I can fill it with tons of girls from this area. She does STEM education all over the place. She's like, this is what they want to hear. They want to hear, we're going to help people, I'm going to use my analytical skills. So she feels we should have an undergraduate degree, B-S-H-E, okay? Um, I, I love this, I think she's absolutely right, but, It'll take us a while because, you know, OSU moves slow. It'll be the first such thing in the world, too, so it wouldn't be easy to do. Okay, so um, comments? How many, how many uh, people here would sign up for BSHE? <laughs> Show me the jobs. I knew you were going to say that, Aaron. No, I, I'm glad you brought it up, Aaron. All right, so you noticed your last homework problem was jobs, right? This is a tough issue. Um, did anybody get some good solutions beyond the Peace Corps? Yes, Katie. There's a STEM education job open up at, with women of engineering at OSU. Oh, yeah. That's cool. Nice. We're going to run out of class and apply. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Peace Corps you can go to, right? I talked the other day from uh, Danny Livingood. Uh, they want engineers. Okay, uh, there's, did anybody else find anything interesting with respect to jobs? Yes, Aaron. There was kind of like a, it was kind of the regional manager of a habitat organization in some country I'd never heard of, so. All right, yes. On a lot of high level jobs, like policy level. And really? Uh, especially like humanitarian, or not humanitarian, environmental. Environmental. Types of jobs, but they weren't specific to engineers. It would be something like, Geological science or something like that, but it's stem related. Okay, yes. Did you get? Um, I found a lot of uh, <coughs> like 
that the UN was actually publishing, and they had a lot of actually policy things where they, they didn't say they were job openings, but they highlighted the engineer's role in policy making in these like specific areas. Interesting. Yeah. Krista. Um, it looked like a lot of the jobs, like the one you're referring to, um, it takes a lot of engineering skills, especially maybe system engineering skills, because that's what I'm used to. Um, you know, project management and um, interdisciplinary communications like that. But they never specified engineering. Yeah. Right. Um, anybody find anything? So we talked about the UN. Go ahead, Nicole. I'm Dr. Bixler at Design Outreach is currently hiring for humanitarian engineers. Is everybody here? Dr. Bixler is hiring somebody for um, Design Outreach for humanitarian engineering for Life Poem. Um, they may, so we heard about UN. What about World Bank? Any anybody find anything there? Well, there I saw a lot about NGOs and yeah. openings. Like there was one in Cincinnati called Design Impact, who they had like internship opportunities. They had uh, project manager openings and things like that for their they had projects like water pumps, um, making more nutritious food. Yeah, I think that's actually a very good possible source for a job in this area um, is an NGO. Um, uh, somewhere in the world, wherever. There, uh, you know, the World Bank last year estimated there's 29,000 NGOs in the world. It's not like there's just a few. There's a lot of them. So, yeah, I think that finding your way into an NGO could be a way to go. Um, the, um, I've heard there's things at the World Bank. I don't know anything specific. You brought up the UN issue. Uh, several other things, STEM education job. So the, see, the thing is, there are jobs. Yes. The World Bank one is like more of technology consultancy type of things, like in house education, and like they would have projects and they would want engineers to consult in project management, how to implement those. Really? Like, yeah. Good. But you need like advanced degree, like either in a master's or PhD or something like that. Oh, really? Some experience. Also, even the UN is like usually like by your yeah. Well, I mean, I, uh, this uh, this takes time too to develop. I mean, it is a little unusual for engineers to get involved in development. Period. I mean, it's economists. Yes, Katie. Yeah, I found the same thing where they wanted like five years of experience. Engineering world health is based on a Duke, and they hire five master's engineers to do five years of They won't take anyone under five to seven years unless you have a PhD plus two years of experience. So there's a lot of that. I see. That might be related to the competency issue uh, where they want to make sure you don't have somebody make a mistake when they're young. Well, it is. Yeah. And you remember, you know it is when you start looking for a job, right? Everybody wants 20 years of experience and blah, blah, blah. And they want to pay you nothing. So you just apply. Yes. I noticed that the Peace Corps. Um, would not allow anybody in that had any experience in intelligence. So really? if you've worked for the CIA, you're not allowed to work for them. I think wow. you can volunteer, but not be employed by them. Wow. And I think that is, I mean, it's most, well, there are a lot of engineering jobs in intelligence, yeah. right? And I, and I think they're obviously very smart people in those jobs with a mind for solutions. I don't know what their what's behind their policy. Yeah, but I thought that was what but I You can take some guesses, right? Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, um, last slide. Um, we'll stop there. Uh, your your um, 